Father God, we thank you for allowing us to see another Lord's Day. We thank you, God, because you allowed us to see the bright sunshine. We thank you, God, because you allow us to feel the Christmas in the air. We thank you, God, because you allowed us to put one foot in front of the other and make it to your house. So, God, for that, we say thank you. God, some of us may not be feeling physically the best, but you allowed us to be here. And for that, Lord, we say thank you. There are many that started out with us in 2017, and if you were to call their names, they would not be able to answer. But, God, you allowed us to be able to be here, and God, for that, we say thank you. God, we thank you for each and every home that is represented. God, we thank you for the congregations that have come together in unity so that we might be able to show people that it pays to serve you. It pays to have one heart. It pays to have one mind. It pays to have us come together to show love, not only to one another, but show people in the world that it pays to love you. God, we thank you because you've allowed us to be able to be able to show our lights and to blend our lights so that in this moment in time, we can allow our lights to shine. Shine bright in Ardmore. Yeah, shine bright in Woodwood. Shine bright in Pitt Valley. Shine bright in Philadelphia. Shine bright all over this land so that we can show love to all. Be with us now as we go into this service and God, because you've been so good, we know, we can feel your presence right now. And we know that you're going to just take us higher in your praise and glory so that we might be able to edify each other. But most of all, God, so that we might be able to glorify you. Now, God, we ask that you would teach us that model prayer that you taught your disciples. Allow us to sing, Our Father, who art in heaven.
Psalm 133. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountain of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Others. 
Only you can change our hearts. Only you can fix our minds to think of those things that are pleasant and good and lovely and worthy and helpful and kind and patient. Even when we don't really feel like it sometimes, just being human, you are the only one that can fix us up. So Father, I ask you now, as we remember the one who, even though he wasn't perfect, and we know that, but he gave his life so that others may be free. Free to go to school where they want. Free to live where they want. Free to have good jobs to take care of their families. Free to worship where they want. You created us all, God, no matter the color of our skin, no matter our face, where we live, how much money we have in our pockets. You created us all. To live on this earth as we should live. So I ask you, God, no matter what's going on in Washington, no matter what's going on in Russia, North Korea, it does not matter because you are the God of all gods. I am that I am. I will be who I will be. I am the creator of the universe. You are my creator. You shall lift up your heads, O ye gates, and let the Lord enter in. Worship the Lord in all of his glory and all of his majesty. Hear, O Israel, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your mind, all of your heart, all of your strength. This day, give us the power, God, to look beyond our own insignificant selves because we are significant in your eyes. So no matter what goes on in Washington, no matter what we hear on TV, individually and collectively, help us stand together in a common bond of peace and love and unity. As Dr. King had said, I choose love. It's a burden to hate. It's too much to hate. It's too much to be downtrodden, not to smile, to be unforgiving. This day, let us choose love. In the name of our Father, thank you, God.
many of y'all remember the singer Wilson Pickett? <laughs> he always would say, I'm feeling all right now. <laughs> very good, very good, very good. Um, just let me see the hands of everyone who has never, ever been here before. Well, I want you to know. Give them some love, first of all. You know, we've been 123 years waiting for you to come. <laughs> Our congregation is 123. We will, better say, be celebrating 123 years of life this year. And we are blessed. We are blessed because we have a lady who has spent a hundred and three years as a part, as a member, as the family of Zion. I'm going to ask Aunt Caroline Merle if you could help her to stand up. And let's give her a little love. you're always, you are always, and these are not just words, empty words. You are always welcome here at Zion Baptist Church. Always welcome here. And um, there's some love in this house. I should say there's a lot of love in this house. Now, we're not perfect. Somebody says, if you find the perfect church, join it, and it won't be perfect no more. <laughs> Glory, hallelujah. <laughs> but we love you. I was thinking about the words I said on Friday night about loving you, and, and I mean that from the depths of my heart. We love you. We love you, Bethlehem. We love you, Mainline Reform. And we love you all who are here. We truly and honestly love you. And uh, we're making a difference. We're shining forth a light. Today we are being live streamed. And this service will be on YouTube. So maybe in August when you're on your vacation in the mountains. <laughs> You want to go back to the cold Sunday in January <laughs> and the fellowship well, on YouTube. On YouTube, then. Enjoy our worship. Enjoy our worship. You're welcome. You're welcome. Now, we want to acknowledge uh, the presidents of the congregations. Um, I want to start with the chair lady of our Deaconess Board. Stephanie Jones, I told you Stephanie. <laughs> and then Deacon Ralph Major, the chairman of our diocese. Then the great president of Mainline Reform and the great president of Temple Bethlehem of Linwood. Stephanie, come on, honey. Give her some love, everybody. Television for some reason. <laughs> but 
we sang very well. <laughs> I mean, we sounded great. So I just thought about that. I said, wow, if I can still fit, I don't know. So I thought, all these years still doing the same thing and making a difference. And I wanted to share this with you, that if you get a chance, um, it's from um, Robert F. Kennedy's um, remarks at the Cleveland City Club, April 5th, the day after Martin Luther King was assassinated. And it's called um, The Mindless Venice of Violence. And at the end, he says, talking about our lives on this earth, but we can perhaps remember, if only for a time, that those who live with us are our brothers, that they share with us the same short moment of life, that they seek, as we do, nothing but the chance to live out their lives in purpose and in happiness, winning what satisfaction and fulfillment that they can. Surely this bond of common fate, surely this bond of common goals can begin to teach us something. Surely we can learn, at the least, to look around at those of us, of our fellow man, and surely we can begin to work a little harder to bind up the wounds among us and to become in our hearts brothers and countrymen once again. So, we can make a difference. Good morning, everybody. congregations from the Clean Line Reform Temple and Temple Beth Am Israel. We welcome you here to Zion on this anniversary celebration. Um, it is always a high time in our year. And, and I think we've begun to gather more often than this Sunday, but we keep saying we, we need to do this. And now, more than ever, is when that should happen. Um, I would be remiss if somebody didn't say something about the polit political climate of this day. And what I think uh, Martin Luther King might have said, I often wonder, in times like this, what Dr. Martin Luther King would have said, if he had come back and would stand in front of you and say to you, what has become of my dream? There's no doubt that if you had to answer him last week, you might would have said that, I'm sorry, Martin, but your dream almost has become a nightmare. <laughs> but he would say, don't give up there. Keep on marching. <laughs> James Baldwin, um, the great American, African-American poet and writer and a friend of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said that ignorance aligned with power is the most ferocious enemy that justice can have. For the President of the United States to believe that Haitians have not contributed extraordinary things to American society is just ignorant. For him to denigrate all the countries of the continent of Africa is woefully ignorant. We can be outraged, but we shouldn't be surprised. <coughs> Maya Angelou once said that when somebody shows you who they are, believe them. <laughs> These kinds of comments are nothing new for this president, and that's sad. Let's not kid ourselves. These comments are, aren't racial, not racially charged, 
They're simply racist. So what he said a couple of days ago is not surprising. Who are we fooling? One of the most disappointing things about the last few days has not been the comments themselves, but the more disappointing thing has been the silence coming out of the Republican Party. It is so quiet that it is deafening. In times of situations like these, I often wonder what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would say. Here's what Dr. King has already said, and so here's what he would likely repeat even louder today. He said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. He said, be be he believed that in the end, we will be remembered not for the words of our enemies, but for the silence of our friends. He often said history will have to record that the greatest tragedy of this period of social transition was not the vitriolic words of bad people, but the appalling silence of good people. Dr. King said that he was not afraid of the words of the violent, but the silence of the honest. He believed that to be silent was to betray. Martin King said, and I quote, I agree with Dante that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who, in a period of moral crisis, maintain their neutrality. There comes a time when silence becomes betrayal. Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail, if you've ever read it, spoke largely to just things like this when he implored the nation's ministers and rabbis and priests not to remain silent about the events of the day. So on this weekend, and from this day forward, it is my wish that we no longer have a deafening ear turned towards silence. Let us remember that the only thing necessary to cause evil to triumph in the world is for good people to do nothing. You don't have to sell dope. You don't have to sift or sniff coke. You don't have to rob anybody. You don't have to steal anything. You don't have to stab anybody or knock anybody in the head. Just sit on your hands and just stay out of the struggle. Just join the conspiracy of silence. Just hold your peace and wickedness will win and the wishes of this president will triumph and people will be destroyed. We must all come to grips with the fact that this president is morally and mentally unfit to hold office. It has been documented that this president tells 5.7 lies a day. That's more than 2,000 lies since he's been in office. And full disclosure, and I'll be out of your way in a minute. I'm, I was never, uh, I was never um, a fan, or I've never been to visit the Statue of Liberty. Why? I've always believed that because my people were never allowed to enter this country from that island, there's not a place uh, that, that holds any, any, um, uh, any place of importance to me. I've never given much credence to the words engraved on Labor, uh, Lady Liberty. Uh, my people didn't come by way of Ellis Island with bags in hand. Instead, my people came packed in the bottom of ships 
like sardines off the coast of the Carolinas. Right, right. The words on Lady Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I'll lift my lamp beside the golden door. That's never a place that my people were allowed to enter. But it's become clear to me over the last week that it has a place of significance when you look at the people of Haiti and you look at the people of Africa, Guatemala, Mexico, those people who just want a fair chance. It was good enough for Europe. Why not Africa? Why not South America? Why not, why not the Caribbean? But I simply say to you, that beginning this day forward, that now is not the time to be silent. Thank you. everyone for inviting me here today. I was at the federal courthouse a few days ago and I looked up onto the ceiling there and the word said justice is the guardian of liberty. Justice is the guardian of liberty. That, those were the words that were literally emblazoned upon the ceiling there. On this Sunday, this special Sunday, those of us would not necessarily be at a worship service, have come to join together to honor a great man whose life was all about justice and freedom, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose legacy burns ever more powerfully and ever brighter, even as the days get darker. I, I was born in 1961 in, in Philadelphia. My memories of that era are filled with Dr. King, his incredible oratory, his courage, and his tragic death. As I grew up, Dr. King's stature grew ever greater. We had a national holiday, and civil rights and equality for all people in this country seemed to be marching in the direction that Dr. King had started. We were moving forward, and I was moving forward. Twenty years ago, my family joined Mainline Reform Temple, and as we became more and more active, we were so proud of the community connections and spirit of our temple especially our connection to Zion Baptist Church. And 10 years ago, we elected an African-American president. Didn't we all think of Dr. King that night in November of 2008? Didn't it seem that we were all marching together again towards justice and freedom? Wasn't that part of the promised land that Dr. King had foresaw? Well, as Dr. King also foresaw, there would still be difficult days ahead. It's hard to believe, it's hard to believe that a few months ago we were told that the Nazis and Klansmen could be very fine people. <laughs> but this past December, on December 12th to be exact, we were all marching together, marching together again. Watching those election returns from Alabama, we were all marching again from Selma to Montgomery, hanging on, waiting for justice, waiting for the vote totals to come in from Selma, Montgomery, and Birmingham, waiting to go from darkness to hope. I felt the spirit and power of Dr. King's words had returned to lead us, lead all of us, to a time of renewed faith and activism, to inspire us once again with the strength to continue to fight for liberty and justice for all. While I was composing my words for today, yet again we were assaulted by the words of the person who now lives in the White House. How long must we endure it? Dr. King answered this very question in Montgomery, Alabama at the end of the march from Selma. Do you know what he said? Not long, not long because no lie can live forever. Not long, 
Not long, not for long will we be living in times prophesied by Isaiah where justice is turned away backward and righteousness stands from afar. For truth has stumbled in the street. Just as we were together at Mainline Reform Temple on Friday night, and we are together today, we must continue to work together to pray together. We cannot let ourselves be divided. We cannot let Dr. King's dream become a memory. We must keep alive all the good things we associate with Dr. King today and every day until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Board of Directors and each and every member of our congregation, I thank our dear friends at Zion Baptist Church for welcoming us into your home today to celebrate the memory and legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Just a few short months ago, I had the honor of addressing my fellow congregants at Beth Am on the evening before our holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur. On that occasion, I spoke about gratitude a profound sense of thanks for all that our community has meant to me and my family and for the many ways in which we lift each other up in good times and bad. The same powerful feeling of gratitude fills me today in this beautiful sanctuary on this important day and before this electric congregation. Whether as individuals we're moved to be present by prayer, by song, or by service, the opportunity to come together to honor and echo Reverend King's messages of equality and service, to reinforce the many values we share in common and the beautiful differences in our religious cultures, and to celebrate our friendship and our common purpose in the world is an opportunity for which we are deeply grateful. Grateful, grateful like you sung this morning. At the outset, I'd like to call out thanks to Reverend Pollard, Rabbi Strauss, Rabbi Newberg, Rabbi Ackerman, Cantor Portnoy, Hazan Messinger, Virginia Pollard, Dean Mallory, Caroline Hatcher, and to all the other lay leaders and members of Zion Baptist Church, Mainline Reform Temple, and Bethlehem Israel. Thanks for all you do publicly and lots behind the scenes to make this a special weekend of fellowship and service to make it possible and to promote the beautiful partnership among our congregations throughout the year. Today we feel the wonder of being pulled together by love, by mutual respect, and by our belief in the certain basic truths about humanity. But in preparing to speak with you this morning, I was struck by the fact that just this past summer, we also felt the pain of being pushed together by sinister forces that were motivated by hate and capitalizing on fear. The night was August 11, 2017, and the place was the central grounds at the University of Virginia. You see, I'm a proud graduate of the University of Virginia. I went there when the word Charlottesville referred to just a place, a small college town nestled in the Blue Ridge Mountains. It was the place where I met my husband, a place with a lively intellectual and cultural scene, a place surrounded by some of the most beautiful rolling countryside you'd ever want to see, and a place steeped in history and reverence for cherished American values. But the meaning of Charlottesville changed irretrievably over that fateful August weekend. Just days before my daughter returned to the university to start her second year there, we watched incredulously as a mob of white supremacists marched with tiki torches down the lawn. The lawn is the most beloved space at the university. Surrounded on all sides by the historic buildings of the central grounds and leading up to the rotunda, a non-denominational temple of learning. The lawn is the place where the university commu community comes together for every purpose under the sun, to mourn tragedy, to honor world leaders, to protest important causes, and to celebrate academic achievement. It's a few hundred yards from where my daughter sleeps each night, 
and it became the backdrop for a ghoulish scene on August 11th when members of the Unite the Right movement marched, <laughs> chanted, white lives matter, and Jews will not replace us. To see this honored and revered place desecrated by agents of hate was shocking and frightening, to say the least. To think that the term Charlottesville, home to so much beauty and so many fair-minded, decent people of all stripes, would now become synonymous with racially motivated intimidation, violence, and death, was and continues to be surreal and deeply disturbing. As a Jew, I don't pretend that sharing space as the object of white supremacist hate gives me any real sense of what it's like to live as an African American in our country. But it has sharpened my focus on one of the most critical challenges facing our country, how to assure that the strides we've made over the last 50 years since Reverend King led the shift in our national thinking about civil rights are not undermined and how to assure that basic human decency remains a non-negotiable in our government and in our daily discourse. Citizens of our American democracy can absolutely have reasonable policy-based disagreements about the tax code, how to provide health care for more Americans, and how we should face various foreign policy challenges but we must not slide backwards into a society where it's acceptable for average Americans without clear condemnation by all of our leaders to assert that some members of the human race are less worthy than others by virtue of their race, religion, or national origin. The immediacy and critical nature of the challenge before us was only emphasized again for me this week with the undeniably racist comments made by our nation's president. Given our imperative, how should we react to events that flash back to terribly dark moments in human history? What's our best strategy to confront abhorrent worldviews? How do we respond productively when we're dumbfounded by others' behavior? How can we make a difference and ensure that hatred remains a fringe perspective? A great leader once warned us, moderates have been silent while those who made political capital of racial prejudice have had their way. Does this sound familiar? Like something ripped from contemporary commentary on recent events? In fact, these were the words of Martin Luther King Jr. during remarks he gave at the University of Virginia on March 25, 1963. Reverend King spoke in Charlottesville at a low point in the Civil Rights Movement after the movement's failure to achieve desegregation in the bus terminals in Albany, Georgia. But only weeks before the tide was to turn with his arrest in Birmingham, Alabama, and public horror at the violence against protesters there, and only five months before his famous I Have a Dream speech on the Washington Mall. Reverend King's instruction couldn't be more appropriate if he had been alive to witness himself the distressing events in Charlottesville or the comments of the president this week. How should we react to these events? I submit that we cannot be cowed. Instead, we must be motivated. Motivated to speak up, as we've already heard this morning. <coughs> motivated to call out racism and bigotry, no matter who is the object, wherever it rears its head. Motivated to vote and to hold public officials accountable for their failure to condemn hatred and their, for their willingness to stoke hatred for political ends. Yes. Dr. Kim said, himself said, as you also already heard this morning, that in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. In addition to speaking out, however, I believe we also need to reach out. This fall, I was fortunate to attend a talk at the Pennsylvania Women's Conference by Brene Brown professor of social work at the University of Houston, who researches the subjects of courage, vulnerability, shame, and equality. And sorry, and empathy. She also believes in equality. <laughs> she is the author of four number one New York Times bestsellers, and her TED Talk, The Power of Vulnerability, is one of the five top most TED Talks in the world, with over 30 million views. 
Her new book, in her new book, Braving the Wilderness, The Quest for True Belonging and the Courage to Stand Alone, Dr. Brown asserts that as a society, we have become disconnected from one another. In order to protect ourselves from conflict, discomfort, and vulnerability, we stay quiet or pick sides, and in the process, adopt the behavior of the people with whom we passionately disagree. But as Reverend King said, let no man pull you so low as to hate him. <laughs> Brene Brown shares a similar instruction. As one of the keys to true belonging and connection, she reminds us that people are hard to hate close up. That we must move in to each other, including those with whom we have fundamental disagreement, in order to stem the tide of dehumanization that is occurring throughout society, a destructive tendency that spans the entire political spectrum. Brown says that we must hold hands with strangers by seeking out moments of collective joy and pain where we can't forget our connection to one another as humans. I take it as a personal challenge, and if I may be so bold today as to challenge each of our religious communities, not only to speak out about injustice and to demand that basic human truths be recognized in every hall of power throughout our country, but also to reach out by finding ways to commune on a personal level with people who seem truly different from us. By this, I don't necessarily mean that we have to befriend avowed white supremacists. Although I do urge you to Google the name Daryl Davis, who does, does just that, and has convinced 200 KKK members to give up their robes. What I do mean, though, is that we extend ourselves to people outside our usual circles. People who live outside the Philadelphia suburbs, people who voted for a different presidential candidate, and people who have very different life experiences from our own. I submit that it is only by rehumanizing others, especially those with whom we have legitimate policy differences, only by leaving our echo chambers and, and trying to understand the basis for other perspectives, and only by reminding ourselves that most Americans, no matter what levers they pull in the voting booth, love their children, want a better future for their families, and believe in the importance of kindness and respect for others. Only by taking these steps will we break down the seemingly entrenched factionalism that divides our society, and in doing so, make true progress. It is only by reaching out in these ways that we can begin to heal the fracture in our society laid bare this past August in Charlottesville and this past week in the White House. In order to truly honor the memory of Reverend King, we must do no less. Thank you. Thank you to all of our leaders for your very good and timely words. We have a moment now we call the pastor speaks the pastor's words. I don't have much to say today. <laughs> Would like to say that this afternoon, I am going over to no, West Philadelphia okay. to the Goodwill Tabernacle no. Baptist Church. Our son in the ministry, John Gray, Reverend John Gray, uh, is celebrating 10 years of pastor. <coughs> at Goodwill Tabernacle. Now I know some of us are obligated to be at the uh, Martin Luther King Main Line Association in Brimar College, but um, Union and I are going to be over in West Philadelphia, 57th and Haverford, and all who can come, especially of our singers, all who can come, we'd like for you to come because John Gray is a good fellow. We want to make his heart happy. We want to make his heart happy. Um, Bible study, we begin uh, studying the book of Psalms on Wednesday evening. And let us not forget all of our prayer services this week, 6.30 a.m. on Tuesday morning with Reverend Carol. 
and then Wednesday evening a Bible study as well. Bible study on Friday. I'm going to have some help with the pastor's words. Rabbi Strauss. Bill, what we're going to do on Wednesday. On Wednesday. So, um, you know, we began together Friday with dinner and then a day of service, Rise Against Hunger. We sang together, prayed together, learned together both Friday night and tonight. We've heard that uh, we make, need to make a new song together and that our words can't stay just here in this sanctuary. Uh, on Wednesday evening, I invite you to join us here at 7 o'clock uh, for a film called I Shall Not Be Silent. It is about the life of Rabbi Dr. Joachim Prince. Rabbi Prince was born in Germany, was the last little rabbi in Berlin until he was expelled by the Nazis in 1938, and was the person who introduced Dr. King in Washington, D.C. in the summer of 1963 before he gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. And it's about his life and the life of the American and African-American community and the struggle for civil rights and for justice in America. I think it will inspire us and certainly give us much to talk about afterwards. So join us Wednesday evening here at 7 p.m. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for your indulgence. Our memorial flowers today are on our pulpit in loving memory to the memory of Dr. Martin King Jr., who, <coughs> excuse me, according to our church historian, George Hearn, preached here as a seminarian. Right here. Blessed are they who die in the Lord, yea, say of the Spirit, for they rest from their labors and their works do follow them. How about another song? We all feel like hearing another song. We feel like hearing another song. Make some noise right now. The first lady, all right. The first lady of the church just set me straight. I want to say one thing first. Um, on Friday night, I spoke about everyone. But uh, I did not include our sister, Carolyn Hatcher. Stand up, Carolyn. Stand up, Carolyn. Carolyn, we call her the mainline queen of gospel. Don't we, Kim? Yes, we do. And Virginia really dressed me down coming home because she said, you didn't say anything about Dean Mallory. <laughs> Dean has been the minister of music here at Zion for 30, going on 32 years now. a very blessed entrepreneur. He really is. He's a hairstylist. And he has his own business in Bridgeport. The hardest working hairdresser in America. Yes, he is. And he is so gifted and so talented. You know you hear artists come out with their selections and their renditions. But when Dean sings it, it sounds so much better. <laughs> sounds so much better. So, Carolyn, I apologize for two things on uh, Friday. And Dean, we love you very much. service on Friday evening and Shabbat service because after dealing with 48 hours of what the president said I didn't feel like smiling at anybody but after our coming together and after our worship I was smiling 
right. My heart was lighter. Uh, and I really was feeling good. After we worship, there's, that, that, that's why we should forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. It makes us better people, it really does. Now we're going to go into our time of worship wherein we give. This is our offering time. This is our offering time now. Y'all been sitting a long while, haven't you? But we're going to give you a chance to move. And we're even going to give you a chance to groove. We have a custom in our church. You know, the older I get, the more I love being a, a, of the Anabaptist denomination. Anabaptist. Uh, started in the 1600s by a gentleman named John Smythe, S-M-Y-T-H. Anabaptist baptized again. One of our tenants is Believer's Baptism. That's why we have this pool in the back wherein we baptize you when you're cognizant of your being baptized. And um, we are of the same uh, cloth as the Amish and the Mennonite who are Anabaptists as well. I love being an Anabaptist, but one thing we do in our spin on the Anabaptist uh, life and religion and faith is we bring our offering on the day that we worship. Paul wrote in one of his parenthetical uh, sections of the New Testament, for on the first day of the week, let each man lay aside what he has purposed to give. And on the back, well, yes, on the back of our bulletins, we're gonna read the last paragraph there that says, help me Zion, remember this, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work, as it is written. He has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. I ask our ushers to please make us ready. Trustees, if you would make us ready too. Miss Virginia, ready for you. We're going to ask if the front row of singers could just stand to the side. We're going to, um, yeah, there's some room there. Okay. And our, our, our uh, men, front row of men here, if you could just help us out just a little bit, please. Just help us out a little bit. I'm gonna be dressed down for this too. But I've been dressed down for 48 years. So. That's right. And we're going to ask if our trustees would come now. The plates, the gold plates that are coming before us are for the, the joint scholarship program we have together with Mainline Reform, Temple Beth Almond Zion, the Max Housen, Jay Pollard Scholarship. Many of you know about it. If you don't, we'll tell you. Um, that's right, our sister Joyce. Can I have somebody from Mainline Reform? Come on, come, 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 come. <laughs> and hold the other plate. That's for the scholarship in honor of Rabbi Max Housen. And who started this? Who started this? We wouldn't have had it without Rabbi Max Housen. Now the Baskets are for the church, for Zion's offering. Now, everyone of Zion members who have purposed in your heart to tithe, we invite you. This is for Zion members right now. All Zion members who have purposed in their hearts to tithe, won't you come now?
just going to give us, in the words of Jackie Gleason, some of us don't remember Jackie Gleason. Do you? Huh? <laughs> A little traveling music. And uh, I, I, I sent you a message team through Danielle, a little cogent, make it a little cogent, a little arch music. We're going to start with those in the balcony. Won't you rise and uh, the handsome usher up there, Marcus Morales, my nephew, is going to lead you around. Amen. Hit it, Dean.